Thank you. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, there are people that are that are still logging in, but I uh, uh, want to welcome everybody to the 16th Annual Early Career Sciences Symposium. Uh, if you, if anybody has been obviously following the news, this was rescheduled from last March, but uh, we're able to all get together again or get together virtually. So I'm glad that's, that that's worked out. Uh, and it, it's actually worked out in terms of the reach. We uh, we were able to increase the uh, number of participants drastically from what our in, typical in-person or their career symposium uh, includes. So there's a, approximately 500 people signed up for this. So it's exciting that there's such broad interest in, in natural history collections. Um, before I th hand things over to Dan Roboski for the formal department welcome, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Cody Thompson. I'm the Mammal Collection Manager and, and uh, Assistant Research Scientist in Ecology and Evolutionary Bio Biology at U of M. I'll be moderating today's session. Um, the format of our sessions, for the for format for the session today, as well as future sessions, which will occur every Friday now until April 2nd from 1 to 3. Uh, will include a series of presentations from our invited speakers, uh, followed by a Q&A and a panel discussion, which will be led by various members of the Early Career Committee. Um, uh, the, the panel discussion is meant to engage all the participants that are, that are here. So if you'd like to ask questions of any of the panelists, um, please submit those questions to the Q&A box and we'll get to those uh, as, as they come. If you have specific questions that you want to direct to, towards a specific panelist, please add the at sign and, and with the person's name, that way we know um, to direct that question to them. Um, we'll, again, we'll address any questions as they come and hopefully it generates some lively discussion between the panelists and the moderators and uh, hopefully help them better inform uh, the audience about natural history collections and why they're such an important aspect of, uh, of uh, academic biology. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn things over to Dan for the formal introduction. All right, thank you, Cody. So I am Dan Roboski. I'm an associate professor and curator in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and a curator of herpetology in the Museum of Zoology. So thank you all for, for coming to this symposium. So that it's pretty awesome to have this lineup of speakers and topics that we and on this general theme of collections. And I know a lot of us have a lot of a lot of thoughts about the role of collections in the future of our field. So I'm going to just share my screen here and uh, go through a few aspects of. Second delay here. So the uh, theme of our collection of our symposium this year is natural history collections, drivers of innovation. So this is the 16th annual early career scientist symposium that we've had. Uh, pretty excited about this one. It's a topic close to my heart. And so if you can go, if you, I'm sure most of you have seen from the website the overall list of speakers and so on that we have. Uh, getting of course today with with uh, Rob Peralnik and ending on April 2nd. So I'd encourage you to peruse these titles and uh, attend as many of these as you can. And just to give a little another recap what Cody mentioned in terms of format. So today with 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 Rob Koronek's talk, we'll have the talk go from approximately 115 or 120 to two or a little thereafter. And then from around two to 245, we'll have a we'll have questions in a moderated roundtable discussion with Rob Koronek and myself. And that general format will carry through for the for the duration of the symposium the exact times, you know, two to two to three uh, for the for the round table discussion following the actual formal talks. I'd like to thank a number of folks for making this symposium possible and for their support, including it, you know, especially the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology for for sponsoring the symposium. And I'd like to thank the other members of the of the Early Career Scientist Symposium Committee 2021. So that's Benjamin Nicholas, Teresa Pagan, Brad Rufel, Cody Thompson, and Taylor West. 
as well as Linda Garcia, Gail Coonlan, and John Megahan, all of whom provided a number of aspects of logistical and other forms of support. And really they were, all these folks were essential in having this come together the way it has. I'd also like to thanks, call out some folks specifically from EED for their, for their, for their, their uh, contributions here and their, and their help overall, especially our current EEB chair, Tricia Whitcock, and our chair through July of last year, Dermot Boyle, who was the chair when we had the original incarnation of this particular symposium theme come to fruition, although it was postponed. And likewise for our museum's director, Hernan Lopez Fernandez also played an important role in, in bringing this together. And he also served on the committee last year, which so he essentially was a committee participant last year in the organization of the symposium, which was now happening, as well as Chris Dick, who is the museum's director through July of last year. So thanks to everyone uh, for your help with, with helping to bring this together. And just to reiterate some of the basic format issues here. So we've got a Q&A round table and the questions read by the moderator. Uh, accessibility, you have closed captioning option. You should also you should see the ability to get the live transcript down near the bottom of your screen there. And on Twitter, if you use Twitter, you can you you, just, you can you can you can uh, you have a hashtag here for UMECSS and you can you can tag you Mish EV if you'd like as well. So I thought I'd give a little, a little a brief overview of Michigan Biodiversity Museums, just sort of a, a snapshot view of, of what mu Michigan museums are. So one of the reasons I think for those of us who are, uh, who are, who are affiliated with the museum here, this is a, you know, a, a, tr a tremendous place to work. And we have, we, have a, we have about 17 million specimens between the Museum of Zoology and the University of Michigan Herbarium. Many of our collections are among the largest university affiliated collections worldwide. Uh, some of the largest, uh, some of the largest collections overall worldwide. This includes birds, insects, mammals, freshwater mollusks, all among the largest university collections worldwide. Fishes are the second largest collection in North America, we have a very large herbarium. And we, we see, receive a large number of, of visitors per year, over 5,000 research visitors per year and hundreds of students training and studying and working and uh, working in the collections. Um, on a year, on an annual basis. So a lot of activity um, from a personal perspective as a curator of herpetology, it's a tremendous privilege to work here because we have, we are the second largest collection of reptiles and amphibians worldwide. So we have a spectacular uh, research and, and, and teaching collection uh, for reptile and amphibian biodiversity. And I'd like to add that one thing about working here that I think makes it really special is that we have a we have a tremendous facility for for our work as well. So the university has invested very heavily in a in a in a in a new research center that where our, our research collections are housed, along along with some of the best working space that I've ever seen. For example, within herpetology and ichthyology, we have a, a fabulous range of, you know, of of basically a tremendous amount of space for actually for working and number of supporting resources and so on. And the university has really shown their commitment to, to the museums overall. This is uh, just one example of the sorts of things that, that we've had seen investment in in recent years. This is a new CT scanner, dedicated CT machine associated with the Museum of Zoology that, that, uh, that is, is housed in the, in, the, in the wet divisions, so the ichthyology and herpetology collections. And so we're using this now to generate large amounts of, of, of high resolution 3D uh, images for for large chunks of the, of the tree of life, especially vertebrates. It's a general resource for the museum community. Uh, I thought, you know, whether I could give, a, I wanted to give a little bit, a very short little personal reflection on natural history collections and, and how it relates to some big questions of, of biological diversity, just to maybe echo a little theme that I don't know if will come up during the course of some of the talks. But, you know, one of the things I wanted to, from the perspective of my personal research program, one of the reasons collections are really important to me is that they enable me to, to access and think about some of the big patterns of biological diversity. And one of the things that I work on in my research is why there are, there are why there is so much variation in species diversity around the world. So when you look at the tropics and the temperate zone, for example, why they have these diversity gradients, latitudinal diversity gradient, and so on. So this is just a heat map of global lizard and snake diversity. And I think one of the things you see quickly when you when you start looking at the data that that, that we have to bear on these kinds of patterns is that 
this is just the, uh, this is the comp corresponding plot of, of the data density that we have from GBIF for reptile diversity worldwide. So you can con contrast the data density in the center to the species diversity that we have on the left. An interesting thing that you can see is that the places where most of the species are, like the Amazon, are the places where we have the least amount of data. And so the, one of the points that I want to make here is that when we, when we think about these big patterns, like why are there so many species in the tropics, you know, if you take any given species of reptile, like this Tenotus skink that I collected in Western Australia a few years ago, Tenotus uber, to answer these questions about why there are so many species in places like Australia or the Amazon, we have to know the answers to basic questions like what habitats do they use? What do they eat? How abundant are they? How do their abundance change through time? How do these species interact with predators and parasites and prey? How is their population structured in space and so on? And but I would contend that we lack even the most basic data to solve some of these greatest mysteries of biological diversity. So we don't have the answers to many, most of these questions for most of the species on earth. And this is a nice paper from a few years ago that really highlights these kinds of biodiversity knowledge shortfalls that we have ranging from taxonomic inadequacy to lack of knowledge of species distributions, lack of knowledge of basic ecological traits, lack of knowledge of evolutionary potential, lack of knowledge of ecological interactions, and how profoundly limiting all of these, these shortfalls are for what we can, what we can say about, about what structures biodiversity in space and time. Now, I want to add one shortfall to this, and it's, it's sort of the, the shortfall of shortfalls, because my contention is that the data that we need are actually being lost forever, and they're being lost at an unprecedented rate and that natural history collections are really the key to understanding large scale patterns and global change. And when we think about places like the Amazon, which are undergoing rapid deforestation, and we think about all the other indicators that we have for change on a global scale, the one thing that, that really keeps me up at night and disturbs me profoundly is that we, what we're really looking at is in light of all of these shortfalls that we already have in addressing these basic problems in, in the distribution of species diversity in space and time, we're facing an irreversible loss of biodiversity data. And that loss is happening right now at a rate that vastly exceeds the loss of the species themselves. So our ability to answer questions about what shapes species diversity in space and time is from my perspective, degrading very rapidly. It's degrading much more rapidly than the rate at which species themselves are going extinct. And so when we look at these, you know, trays of museum specimens, these are some specimens from our own field work. We have, you know, we look at what the modern collection process entails, and we generate these high resolution snapshots of, of biodiversity, multidimensional biodiversity in space and time. And you know, we, I think that when we go to the field today, we take genetic resources, we take things that let us track disease dynamics, we, we take parasite samples, we take microbiome samples, we take skin samples and venom samples and other things that we can use for chemical ecology. We, we record quantitative habitat activity and behavioral data that can be linked to specimens that we have in our collections. And I think that you know, a lot of folks look at museum collections and ask, you know, what can I, what can museum collections do for me? And I guess there's this, almost this attitude that is that we could just call up a museum collection and you know place an order for a set of herpetology specimens or or, or whatever. And I think I, I just want to you know call attention to the fact that all of these specimens also come from really hard boots in the mud field work, and that I think that addressing many of the most pressing challenges that we face requires a renewed commitment to collecting and archiving new biodiversity data. And that's something that I hope does not get lost in this recognition that specimens can provide lots of information for us as we move forward. So there's a, there's a huge and acute need for, for actually undertaking large expeditions today and, and going, getting back to these fundamentals of going to the field and, and collecting fundamental biodiversity data and creating these permanent records of, of biodiversity in space and time. And just to sort of finish this up, this is a wonderful paper led by Cody Thompson from UMMZ Mammals, uh, just published earlier this year. And the title of this paper is Preserve a Voucher Specimen, the Critical Need for Integrating Natural History Collections in Infectious Disease Studies. And I just want to add to the title, which I think is almost perfect. And I'd say, you know, preserve a voucher specimen is really key here. And I'd say this is critical for the, for the very future of ecology and evolution and global change biology and more. And so with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today.
Professor Garalnik. Sorry, a little delay in unsharing my screen here. So our speaker for today is, is Professor Rob Garalnik, who's a uh, professor and curator at the, at the University of Florida and in the Florida Museum of Natural History. And Rob had his PhD from Berkeley, and he was he where he worked on on nearshore mollusks with David Lindbergh, and so he has a he has a solid organismal background, and he moved from there to a a uh, faculty position at the University of Colorado, where he was also a curator of invertebrates, and since that time he's moved to the his present position at the University of Florida. And it's really hard to imagine, and it's actually very hard to summarize Rob's accomplishments and especially the breadth of his research in any sort of simple fashion. I mean, he's worked on everything from an, on the empirical side, from population genomics, uh, remote sensing, actual acquisition of biodiversity data, ancient DNA, um, niche modeling, conservation biology, life history evolution. It's just, just an in, incredible string of like themes that, that all relate to various facets of biodiversity. But I think the place that Rob has really shown incredible leadership is in the biodiversity informatics front. And, I, and, I've, and he's been a leader in thinking about the very data that we put in biodiversity databases. What are our standards? How do we make the data available? How do we use, how do we use remote sensing technologies to gain more of that data? Uh, so he's a pioneer in thinking about biodiversity databases, automation, tool development, web-based tool development, all, the, all these sorts of things. So it's really hard to imagine in some ways where the modern field of biodiversity informatics would be without, without Rob's leadership and vision in this sense. So I won't, I won't continue on here, but I'll turn this over to Rob at this point, who's gonna tell us something about new uses for natural history collections. So, thanks. Hey, 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 Dan, thanks a lot. That was a great, a great introduction. I loved hearing about the importance of, of field collecting. I totally agree with um, a lot of the great comments you, you made to start this uh, symposium. Um, I wanna say hi to everybody as well. Hopefully you can all hear me and everything is good. Um, it's really wonderful to be here today, today to talk about some of the work that I do using natural history collections and collections data. I'm also super excited to also catch um, talks over the next few Fridays from a new generation of scientists showcasing innovative use of natural history uh, collections to address you know, key scientific and societal issues. So um, one last thing before I jump in here, I always start my talks with this sort of contemplative statue that captures the idea of balance because I wanna to cover topics that balance across data sciences and, and domain uh, side work mostly in global change biology and biogeography. This, this um, uh, com contemplative statue is also a reminder for me to like take it easy and slow down. I tend to be a pretty fast talker. So I'll try to keep it slow and the slide is my guiding slide and remember to slow it down and keep it slow. Okay, so jumping right in here, um, what I wanna do is take you on a journey that really started when I arrived to the University of Florida six years ago. And like so many journeys, it wasn't one I totally expected to take. It hasn't necessarily led me to places I thought I would get to or has in, uh, led to those places. And reflecting back on it, it connects a lot of my broader concerns as a scientist. How to thread together data sciences the sort of concept of the extended specimen, which I'll cover later in this talk, and especially the importance of traits and how they are measured on specimens, and how they're used to answer questions, okay? So I think the thing that really catalyzed this journey in a lot of respects uh, started with a quote from a colleague now at UF about trait databases. And I'll just summarize the key points here since you can read the quote yourself, but I wanna um, drive home the, the, key, the key message here. And that's really about the fact that most trait databases are summarizing data at the species level. You know, species level mean values. And that's a good starting place, but I think the important thing here is to really understand how traits vary across environments. We really need to think about measuring traits at the individual level, not at the species level. And so I started to wonder, how we could assemble our knowledge of traits at the individual level. And I was especially interested in integrator traits like body size and body mass, because body mass in particular, well, body size in general, plays a really key role in evolutionary and ecological studies. 
So for many years, I've been really fortunate to be involved with a project called VertNet that many of you probably know. And I noticed that straight data sometimes, sometimes is included in published records on VertNet. Usually the measurements are in weird notations or have challenging abbreviations, but they often are really rich. So here, here is a VertNet specimen record of a wood rat. And here you can see in the label, right, some information about commonly taken external measurements that were probably you know, um, in the shorthand you know, format that was probably from like the, the, the big dawn of mammalogy, you know, the Sea Heart Merriam or some herb mammalogist said, you know, report the traits like this on labels. So we have like a total length and we have some external measurements like hind foot and tail length. We have some um, measurements of the total um, uh, mass and grams, but those measurements are really, really important and valuable, um, but they're often really hidden. So let's take a look at that um, in a little more detail here. So if we think about a record from this red squirrel that is um, available in Arctos, um, we can see, well, wow, we can see that this specimen was, was collected with a firearm. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, but in this, in, this, in this odd field, when we, we represent these data in, in Darwin core format, which is you know, this, this really commonly used standard, um, if we look, at, look deeper in this record, we can see that you know, there's actually some really important information about traits in here. So we can see that you know, this specimen had a hind foot with its claw on that had a length of 49 millimeters. And we can see these total length and mass measurements. So while this isn't in a standardized format, you know, it's in Darwin, Darwin core, there is no Darwin core field that says hind foot with claw, right? This data is hidden in the record and impossible to really recover easily from across the whole corpus of mammal records in VertNet. Right? So the idea would be like, could we standardize the, the data on, bo on body mass and, and total body length in a way that it could be represented as harmonized so it was discoverable across this whole data set? And so that is what we've decided to take on. And I don't wanna go into the gory details of this, but I thought that maybe we could do something here. Maybe we could um, harmonize all this straight data. So when I got to UF, the first person who I brought on board was a software developer who had a passion for natural language processing and, te and text mining. And I think um, in the case of these records, it may have been more like unnatural language processing, but, but anyway, we, we worked together with uh, colleagues, um, John Wachorek and Paula Zermaglio, Paula shown here on the upper right of the slide, to work out a little recipe, right? It was a recipe for getting these data out. So what we did was we took 20 million digitized vertebrate specimen records. We decomposed those records to look for these hidden traits and measurement information. We then extracted records that matched an exhaustive set of synonymies that we developed. And then we harmonized as best we could to standardize units. And so the synonymies were basically those abbreviations, those, those sort of weird formats and notations that people use for these straight data to get, to get those together. And we did a lot, we did a lot of curation to validate our automated extractions, like a lot, a lot. So we wanted to really be sure that we could reduce our false positive and false negative rates so that they were super low. We didn't want to have you know, uh, traits that we missed, and we didn't want to have um, you know, false positives, cases where we extracted something that wasn't, a, wasn't actually a trait. And so after we went through this whole process of refining this um, and, and tweaking this, this tool set to basically deliver the best possible trade data out, which my, my um, developer Rafe referred to as whacking moles to sort of, you know, you, you, you solve one problem, another one pops up. Um, but after we finally got that to the point where we were satisfied with it, we were able to kind of serve it back out and make it a, this delicious um, meal that we could serve back to our community. And we also wanted to assure anyone else um, could could also um, use that toolkit to do to reproduce the work or to use it for new work. And so we developed um, a whole package called Trader that allows people to kind of use these trait extraction um, toolkits themselves. And once we were done, we kind of wanted to know, well, what does it really tell us about how much trait data is available as it stands now? And here we were explicitly after um, kind of two key measurements, total length and body mass, no other trait measurements. And I think the answer here is both wonderful and terrible. It's wonderful because we've got a lot of trait data extracted. Let's just take a look on uh, for avies, uh, for birds and for mammals. And, and no, Dan, no disrespect at all to the herp, herp and ix, ix people. It's just that down, this, down the road in the talk, I'll be using the bird and mammal data for a couple, couple of example studies. Um, what we can see here is we have a lot of species where there are at least 100 length or mass measurements. You know, like for uh, mammals, 
And in terms of length, um, we have like, um, you know, 417 species where there are at least a, a, at least 100 length measurements um, for those, those species, which is really great. It's also a little bit terrible because this is still just a fraction of the data that we know is still out there on labels or even digitized and just not yet available on our specimen data sharing networks, right? So th this is like the tip of the iceberg and what we can do in terms of the trade data. So we also did another thing that I think was really important and I'm gonna come back to, the, come back to it at the end of this talk. We also assembled at least some information on the traits we didn't extract. So this is like a bubble plot that's showing you the overall numbers um, of these trait types. So we kind of typify the traits, we want to know the general number of beak traits, you know, head traits, appendage traits, trunk, trunk traits. And yeah, so you can see there's a lot of gonad traits um, and a lot of beak measurements. But those are really awesome measurements to have. I mean, so much life history revolves around reproduction. And so like knowing that we have all these other traits that we could go after later is super cool. This is like a universe of traits that we can go and, and, and work on down, downstream. Okay, cool. So then we thought to ourselves, you know, we should really just get these data back out to people. That came from community effort. We wanted to push it back out to the community as fast as we possibly could. So what we did was we, we, we basically indexed these data and made these data immediately available back in the vert at portal. So we did this well before we started publishing any work on body size, because we felt the faster, the better for sharing, for increasing creativity. There's lots of people who might want to use these data in ways that we haven't even thought of. Them. Get it out there, let them search for it. So then, you know, Vertna Portal now has a way you can, you know, filter for records that have a length or a, a mass, um, and you can query these, you know, in, in all kinds of neat ways, right, which is really nice. And we wanted to tell people what we did. We wanted to like let them know and be able to find the data and see it. And we wanted to like um, share the share the knowledge and get the word out there. And that's exactly what we did. And it kind of ends the first step in this journey. So that ends step one. But um, I realize this next slide sounds a little like a greeting card. And so um, apologies, but actually it was serendipity that was the next step in this journey. So I had long been thinking about how to use these trade data at scale. And I ran in randomly to a colleague and a graduate student who were interested in data intensive questions about body size. And basically the idea was to use data from these you know, hundreds or maybe even thousands of species to examine this very old and still contentious idea called Berman's rule. Um, and so Berman's rule is um, a rule that was proposed long ago, back in 1847, um, and is really thought to apply both at intra and interspecific levels. And when Berman proposed this rule, he did have an explanation at heart behind how it worked, which is related to heat loss, and how this relates to body size. So, I mean, you can think about this purely and simply from like maybe like, like simple examples of cube animals um, and their surface to volume ratios of these larger and smaller like cube animals shown on the bottom uh, right and the top left. Um, and so basically, you know, the, the smaller cube animal has a much higher surface to volume ratio than the larger one. And because of heat loss around the, around the surfaces, the idea was basically that, that you know, um, uh, larger animals are going to have reduced heat loss. And so they're going to be able to be uh, found in maybe these, these colder, uh, higher latitude areas. And so if you look at this, this sort of um, classic relationship for Bergman's rule, what you can see here is, you know, basically that, that um, larger um, animals within a species might be found in, in these colder environments and smaller animals are found in these warmer environments, right, around this idea about heat loss. Um, but it turns out that, you know, Bergman's rule is really contentious. There's lots of conceptual concerns about, about Bergman's. It isn't clear if the rule is a pattern, if it has a fully articulated mechanism whether those mechanisms are the same at the intra and interspecific level, and whether it's really broadly applicable across animals or more narrowly applicable only in homeotherms. And I can go on about these different arguments, but um, it's also one that I think has um, some concerns conceptually. And so conceptually, uh, I should say um, empirically, uh, empirically, there's there's are some really um, important questions about um, you know whether this is um, due to publication bias. So we might think about the fact that if people aren't publishing results that um, uh, don't support Bergman's or that are are non significant, and there's been um, really really different ways that people have done studies about about these relationships between climate and body size. So people did a bunch of different things. They use different subpopulations or populations across different scales. And so really understanding how to put this together and look at this beyond a meta um, analytic approach, it seemingly would be a really, really important idea. Um, so I think there's a real chance to basically use our trait data to take a data intensive look at Bergman's, right? And that's what we did. 
So in collaboration with, with Christina Reamer here, shown on the, on the, on the right, um, and uh, Ethan White, with uh, Christina leading this work, the game plan was to basically associate body mass values with temperature um, at the location and year of collection of those, of those records, as well as like actually kind of fitting these potential lags so that the previous year or previous five years could be used instead of the year of collection. And then to carefully filter for outliers um, and remove juveniles. And then basically simply fit these mass temperature relationships for as many species as possible where the data were available. We also wanted to look at some questions long asked in the literature about whether um, intraspecific bourbons is stronger for larger or smaller bodied um, animals, um, whether it's, it's um, stronger higher latitudes or varies by class. And I'm not gonna actually cover those, but I'm gonna just mention that it turned out that we really didn't find much pattern here in terms of these, these um, kind of proposed hypotheses. Nothing popped out as being um, strongly supportive that Bourbons was differential across these different kinds of parameter spaces. Um, and let's, let's, let's like take a look at how, this, how the data um, sort of shape up at the global scale. So each one of these black dots on the map is actually a report of a body mass that we derive from this vertnet data that we were talking about earlier. And I pulled forward here three species, um, Marty Spinati, the fisher, uh, a chipmunk, Timius quadrivitatus, um, Synaptimius cooperi, the southern bog lemming, and I wanted to just point out that those three species are, in, are interesting because they, they kind of re, uh, reflect um, different possibilities, right? We see that classical bourbon shape, um, that relationship for the fisher. For a chipmunk, you can see there's really no relationship between um, mean annual temperature and mass. And then for our um, uh, southern bog lemming, we see a converse bourbon's relationship, right? Um, so when we look at this over all the species, um, we had data to fit models for, which is about 960. You can see that while there might be a slight tendency for more negative relationships than positive ones, the vast majority of species don't have a statistically significant relationship between, between body mass and temperature. And it doesn't really vary much by clade, so like looking at birds versus mammals. And we've actually followed up on this work quite a bit. Um, I'm not going to present it in detail here, but we fit many more climatic variables. We've, inc the, we've incorporated more covariates beyond those climatic variables like season collected and sex. We've accounted for phylogeny in these analyses um, using phylogenetically um, uh, generalized least squares. And we don't see really that much improvement in these models. There are, are still relatively weak effects. So again, um, you know, looking at this, these relationships, we, we, we um, sort of um, have a now data intensive uh, ability to look at this in a single modeling framework, right? One modeling framework, we're gonna ask these kinds of questions and understand more about, about body mass relationships with climate. Okay, so um, this um, really uh, uh, is a bookend for a next step in the journey. And um, what I thought might be particularly interesting when I started thinking about these um, climate um, body size relationships was if we could look at body size change over recent time. So in fact, a lot of the reemergence of, of Bergman's rule was in the context of this idea that phenotypic change and body mass shifts might be a third universal response to climate change. I had also wondered if maybe we could look at disturbance, in particular looking at a human disturbance and how that might impact body size. But it turns out this is really hard to do. I mean, it shouldn't be necessarily, right? When we have a specimen, it has a date collected you know, on that specimen. We know when that specimen was found and we have a location. It shouldn't be super hard to look at this in a temporal context, right? But actually it's really hard to do this because of spatial and temporal biases in these data. They could potentially really limit what we can do here. And so that's a really important thing to think about in terms of understanding change over time. But I think there was basically, there is basically a databases for asking some of these questions. Um, so um, before uh, I jump in here and, and do this, what I want to do is is basically introduce um, this this amazing um, star of the next half of my talk, which is Paramiscus maniculatus, which is um, probably the most common and most commonly trapped mammal in North America. I'm going to refer to the species as Pima. So Pima means Paramiscus maniculatus. It's just an abbreviation, and this this redonkulous animal 
is really honestly something of a pest in suburban areas and a carrier of some nasty things like hantavirus. But by far and away, the richest numbers of body mass data and link data that we have available are for this species. And this, this provides us a chance to ask some interesting questions. The, the rich data for Pima give us a, a, a window into asking some um, questions. In particular, does human disturbance, and in this case, we're going to think about human disturbances as, as, as related to urbanization and human population density, um, impact mammal body size? And if so, is this a result of basically just simply an urban heat island where urban areas are warmer? Or is there alteration of habitat and food resources that might drive body size change? Or maybe it's actually potentially fragmentation. Fragmented um, urban areas um, might actually create islands where body size will respond according to island rules. So those are all really interesting questions that we can, can begin to ask if we knew how to look at the temporality of the data and think about how that might work. So what we did was we assembled a relatively unique set of data for this. And so before I jump into telling you more about models and some of the results we found, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the data resources that we use for this study. So we didn't only use natural history collections data, we also pulled two different data resources. One was the North American Census of Small Mammals. Um, this was a census that was done in the 40s and 50s. It generated a ton of data at, at a continental scale using a consistent survey method. And it's really awesome to go back and recognize just how much people were thinking about surveying broadly, um, going out and getting those data, collecting those voucher specimens back in back in the 40s and 50s. And of course, NEON is doing some of the same data, kinds of data collecting now. Um, NEON has a small memo trapping data, data um, uh, um, project that they do across their sites. And actually, if you um, put these data all together, you can see that you know, this is relatively um, amazing in terms of the data density. It's not like there isn't some um, increase in, in data density over time. So there is you know, an increasing amount of data towards the present, but it's not terribly biased. And so you can think about say 1950 and how many records were available then versus say 1995 or 2015. And it's not too far off the money to think about looking at, at, at these data in, in one go to think about trends in, in body size over time. Um, so that's exactly what we did. Um, but to get there, we had to think really, really, really hard about, about some of the problems with, with um, how to localize data across space. I also want to mention before I move on that one of the things that we were surprised to find is that body mass and head body length, which is basically just the, um, the length of, of Pima um, from the head to the, to the, to the beginning, beginning of the tail. So we can take like total length of the specimen minus the tail length to get those head body length. Um, these weren't highly correlated with each other. They're, the correlations were about 0.3 or 0.4. So we want to think about using both of these measures, body mass and head body length, separately when we think about how to model um, changes in body, body size. OK, so um, basically, to look at this, this question about body size change we, and to examine these trends, we wanted to localize the regions um, in order to basically, basically have replicated regions where we can examine body size trends across space. And so what we did was we basically built these evenly sized grid cells as spatial replicates. So again, we could localize the effects and use these spatial replicates um, as random effects in linear mixed models. So to do that, we had to basically think through a couple um, of optimization challenges. How to optimize the most number of records into non-overlapping grid cells. In this case, we set a rule where we required there to be at least four decades where there were at least 10 records of mass or head body length measurements per those four decades. And then we also gathered climatic variables and human population density data for each record at the location it was collected. And we were really fortunate that there were recently published decadal estimates of human population density available at relatively fine resolution. So then what we did was basically fit two classes of models. Um, the first one I'm going to cover here is explicitly spatial, but we also fit a temporal model. The spatial model used climate and urbanization as fixed effects, along with season collected and sex. And then we used grid cell uh, and the source of our data, whether it was NACSM or NEON or natural history collections data, as a random effect. Um, and then what we can do is we can basically start looking at some of these patterns. And so for the spatial models, we're going to focus initially, we can look at the, the trend in, in terms of body mass in relation to the climate gradient, you know, looking at mean annual temperature or mean annual precipitation. And we can see for both um, body mass and head body length for mean annual temperature, we see 
um, relationships that look um, like Bourbon's, you know, where we have the, uh, you know, lower body masses and, high, and warmer conditions. And then for precipitation, we can see, um, sort of surprising to me, um, it was just not the usual way that, that this relationship works. Actually, the um, smaller uh, Pima in, in um, more uh, wet areas, right? So um, we also wanted to look at um, the uh, um, relationships for um, uh, body size in relationship to human population density. And here we can see just for head body length, not for body mass, the head body length decreases with, with human population density increases. And we also, just to kind of show you some of the, the covariates that we fit as sort of con to control for these effects, we also can see here some of these relationships between um, sex and season, okay? So um, finally, we wanted to fit these temporal models. Oh, ooh, sorry, um, let me go back a step. So we, we, uh, we did one other thing, and this is really, really important. Glad I, I'm glad I kind of um, 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 uh, pushed this in here. Um, we fit source as a, a random effect in our models, and we're really, really glad we did this, and here's why. We don't see a strong effect of source for body mass. Those are pretty much the same body masses across NEON data, um, NSM data, and natural history collections data. But we found a really um, different pattern for head body length. And here, NEON data were, were always um, uh, significantly smaller than the data from NSCSM and from the museums. And we thought at first this might be a real effect related to time. We went over and talked to our, our um, uh, friends at NEON. And uh, what we uh, learned was that th since these measurements were always taken on live animals rather than dead ones, um, and it turns out NACSM um, didn't, didn't live trap, um, it's very difficult to actually measure the length of a, of a live mammal. Um, so while mass is comparable, you can put a, 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 the mammal in a bag and, and measure it, um, length is really hard to capture and it's always, um, always underestimated, uh, underestimated because of the way it's measured. So um, it's not that there's an actual trend here in terms of neon data, um, which are more recently collected. It's really a bias in these data that we didn't know about. And so if we didn't carefully think about that, that sort of bias, it would have really impacted our model results. So clearly we, we did not include neon data in our, in our final head body um, base models. So um, let me just show you the, the models here for at the, at the, that cover the temporal trends. So this is really super interesting. I wanted to draw your eye towards the results for body mass, um, the body mass temporal model. And what we see here is, is that basically um, this model shows us that, that body mass is declining, is de decreasing as we go forward in time, as we use decade as a covariate, right? I'm over here in this, in this decade minus. So it's just showing us that, that basically there's a, there's a negative relationship between decade and body mass. However, we tested this really carefully by looking at the delta change in temperature, urbanization, and size within each of our grid cells um, using those decade-based um, uh, slopes that we were able to generate from our random effects. And we really didn't see any indication that increasing urbanization or climate was strongly explanatory of body size change. And so that's really super interesting and sort of a puzzle. We have basically this indication that um, Pima are getting smaller in terms of their mass over time, not their length, just their mass. But we're not quite sure what the driver is on that. So I think the take homes on this really are that, um, oops, sorry, that um, different uh, size proxies might show different patterns of response spatially and temporally. Deer mice are basically shorter but not slimmer in urbanized areas or human population dense areas. This might reflect the heat island but it might potentially also be related to crypsis. And so it's, it's possible that being small avoids detection by humans, and this could be an advantage. And we do find that Pima mass, but not length is decreasing over time. This isn't in relation to urbanization and climate. But okay, so one species, just, just this one very, very, very well sampled species. A bigger question is how response varies across species with different life histories so we started to think about this again, and we thought maybe we can go bigger and really look at this over a larger um, uh, set of species um, and put it all into one modeling framework. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to move on to a couple other things before I run out of time um, here. But I want to uh, call out Maggie Hantak, a, a PRFB postdoc in my lab who um, predominantly works on, on HERPs, but has, has deigned to work on a couple of mammal projects. 
And Maggie has been working on looking at the same general question we looked at in Pima, but using a multi-species approach where we can collate traits such as um, um, average body size or thermal buffering capacity, diurnality, um, to see if species with different traits are showing different responses to climate and urbanization. So what we did was we brought together over 140,000 body size measurements um, over um, hundreds of species and greater than an 80 year time span to look at these questions. And what I don't wanna do is I don't wanna take too much time here to, to, to go over this in great detail, but I do wanna just cover a couple of the, of the things here that, that are um, of interest. Um, so this is more like a taster, but we were basically able to understand more um, from this sort of look across species and across space and time at drivers. And in particular, we find that urbanization um, conditions this temperature body size response with much stronger responses, you know, stronger slopes in areas with human population, with high human population density. So we see a stronger relationship between body mass and renal temperature in these human, human dense um, areas. And the slopes are much weaker and shallower for areas that are more um, in uh, wildland um, areas where humans aren't, which is um, super fascinating. Um, and it's kind of hard to see in these, these lower panels, but if we split mammals into groupings of large uh, and small body sized, um, average body sized mammals, large mammals are actually increasing in length across the, um, the gradient um, in terms of, of um, human pop population density, while small mammals show a very, very weak decrease. So interestingly, this doesn't really align very well with either an island rule effect of urbanization, nor does it really support the idea that urban heat islands are the core drivers of these responses. Instead, we do think this might provide some support and I can explain a little more why if you're interested in, um, in, the, in the panel discussions or, or afterwards for the idea that maybe resource allocations are driving some of these questions about body size relationships across the, the, the um, gradient of, of where humans are found. We can also see the um, that there is a sort of interestingly different kind of pattern for mean annual temperature in relationship to temperature and body mass along the gradient for larger and smaller, smaller mammals. It gives, us a, it gives us a lot of power to look at these kinds of questions in a joint modeling framework, in a single modeling framework. And that kind of leads me to my main point here, which is that um, um, rather than like kind of boring with more charts and graphs, I guess the take home is that we can start building broader frameworks to understand phenotypic response using natural history collections data. And to me, the biggest surprise of all of this work is that urbanization effects for body size appear to be really super strong, perhaps rivaling climate factors long thought to be really critically important for conditioning body size of mammals. So this is like super fascinating and an area we'll be continuing to explore in, um, in some detail in the, in the future. Um, because really these are very broad patterns and we want to kind of get to the more narrow drivers and really understand the mechanisms behind some of these, these results. Okay, I have one more data vignette to show you. And then I'm going to close by bringing it back to data sciences. And so we walked along this path. We walked um, uh, down the road of looking at these body size relationships. But I wanted to take one more sort of sidestep um, towards, towards another area of interest of mine that has grown over the years in terms of phenology. And this is gonna be more broad brush than it deserves, but I think phenology is really important and really critical because when we think about those universal responses to climate change or global change, we're thinking about species distributions, we're thinking about phenology, and we're thinking about, um, about phenotype changes, right? So we're gonna cover phenology really quickly here. Okay, so um, what I wanna really do here is, is just basically show you that we can use natural history collections data to look at phenology climate relationships a much broader scales than we've ever been able to see before. And again, I'm gonna use Pima as a test case. And I'm also wanna point out how, that this is really fun uh, collaborative work with Brian McLean, a mammologist um, who was a PRFB, uh, NSF PRFB fellow at, at Florida with me, and now is a faculty member at, at UNC. So how do we collect data for this study? Well, um, actually, in this case, we were able to use a tremendous amount of, of information from specimen records uh, reporting reproductive condition. We also gathered um, reproductive state information from museum specimen skin tags, along with direct examination of specimens for secondary characters that are indicative of breeding. So on, on you know, your, your labels, so you'll often see uh, reports of that a female is, is, is reproductive, it, it had embryos, and it was lactating, um, it was pregnant, 
Um, and you can also use these sort of secondary breeding characteristics to basically detect on the specimen itself whether the, the female was, was potentially breeding. Finally, we also pulled published reproductive, re, reproductive state observations contained again in the NACSM in that census of small mammals and also in the NEON data that captures reproductive condition as well. What we did was we used those um, presences and absences um, of, of reproduction in basically a um, hierarchical general additive modeling framework that was constrained to be cyclical to simply determine basically the shape of phenologies over, over the year. So you can see day of year on the, on the bottom part of these, these plots on the right and on the y-axis you see the probability of breeding. And it's really gratifying because what these show are things that are really intuitive to people and you kind of go, oh, I got that. Like Northern forests up in the North, you see these shorter um, phenology periods that are, are peaked um, pretty, pretty um, strongly where you have high probabilities of breeding in late spring. You have really low probabilities of breeding during the, the winter period. But like in the Mediterranean, California ecoregion where we kind of you know, fit these models across these ecoregions using these hierarchical approaches, you can see like in, in um, California, it's like a really temperate um, mild climate. You know, people are breeding year-round effectively at lower probabilities, right? Which is really cool. And we can also see some things we didn't expect. We can see some humped, you know, uh, bimodal distributions where we see two peaks by ref re ref be reflecting low probability of breeding, especially in summer months where it might be too too warm. So, um, in general, what's really cool is we can kind of see things that make sense to us. Um, we also did the same kind of analysis, thinking about not ecoregions, but basically spatially um, separatable climate clusters, areas that are climatically different that are spatially arranged across the, uh, across the um, continent. And we basically used a spatial clustering, a climate spatial clustering um, me mechanisms with climate data to kind of pull out those clusters and look at phenology across those climate clusters, right? And then what we could, what we could do is we could basically use linear mixed models um, using temperature and precipitation um, of the prior months um, uh, from the collection date of the sample along with photo period as variables, as covariates, to basically understand what climate predictors are important for driving phenology. And I'm not going to go into excruciating detail here, because you can read about this work in um, this month's issue of Ecology, where the, pap the paper is now out. But what we also did was we basically extracted these, these slope estimates for the random effects across these climate clusters to see if there were stronger or weaker relationships in different climate regions in terms of the relationship between breeding and say temperature or precipitation. And what this um, plot on the right shows is that both temperature seasonality and precipitation both seem to strongly condition the strength of PEMA phenological responses to either precipitation um, or temperature as sort of a short-term uh, resource availability axis. Um, and though I might be a little bit skeptical about how we can do space for time substitutions in relationship to understanding how this might relate to breeding responses over time, we're super interested to go back and see if we can pick up, you know, basically a phenological signal over time in the data we have to understand that there is a way that we can use these spatial responses and maybe even the temporal responses to predict response of reproductive phenologies in the future, right? Because so we can do that, we're basically able to get ahead of understanding how phenology might change in response to changing um, global conditions. Okay, so phew, we, um, we made it um, to the near the end of this talk. So um, what I wanna do in the very last part of this talk, um, and this is last but not, but not least and, and pretty quickly, is coming back to where we started about data sciences. And so this is my way of looping the talk. And so the footprints of my journey come full circle, right? Um, so I mentioned we pulled uh, total length and body mass as two key traits, but I actually used in a couple of the studies I presented head body length. And you may be wondering to yourself, well, how did you get that measurement? Like you had the total lengths, but what about the tails? You know, how did you get that, that just the head body size um, measurements? So, um, in, to a larger point, there are huge numbers of external measurements people take on specimens. And there are even more numbers of anatomical measurements that are, are taken 
by people, especially given all the new uh, tools we have to measure phenotypes. And, and Dan mentioned CT scanning, it's amazing. Um, I'm really impressed by the work we we're doing at the Florida Museum and broadly on that topic as part of OBERT. Um, so there's all this new measurement data that we're gonna be able to generate on specimens. And um, you know, we also have a ton of different resources. So I mentioned VertNet and we pulled data out of VertNet, but there's lots of different resources out there. It's not just VertNet, there's also, you know, basically all these other resources um, um, that span from archaeology to paleontology, where measurements it's critically in, in much of what paleontologists think about and do, all the way through to resources that, that may have, have trait data available that just don't even know it yet. So there's all these other resources, intentionally or not, that cross multiple di disciplines that sort of trait measurements. Um, so the question I had is, how are we going to build a better mousetrap for making trait data available, right? And so that is a question that I was really fascinated by. And we were lucky enough to, to receive some funding from the NSF to try to build a new tr type of trait data store explicitly focused on measurements taken from individuals and spanning across neontology, archaeology, and paleontology. We call this project Futurus, the Functional Trait Resource for Environmental Studies. And it's really a, a project that at heart thinks about how we develop communities and best practices around um, storing, aggregating, assembling, using uh, measurement data from specimens. So providers can use a set of tools to mobilize their trait data into Futurus, where they can, where we can help to reconcile how people um, measure traits and standardize that reporting, clean the data, and actually use machine reasoning to make inferences over that data to help with discoverability. And then we provide ways for users to access all that content. I'm not gonna go over all the details. I wanna be cognizant of my time, but Futurist can help assure data reuse. And I think most excitingly, it can be used for things like allometry studies, where if we have a lot of mass estimates taken from um, modern uh, animals and we have a lot of anatomical measurements taken across archaeo and paleo, we can begin to improve our allometric um, equations and, and under, understand how to use them more effectively um, in the context of these broadly assembled kind of data sets. So beyond, behind Futurist is a trait ontology. I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but the key thing is that backing Futurist is basically the definitions of traits and their measurements. And that's done as a community process where, where people have traits that they wanna to bring to Futurist, we go, okay, yeah, we don't have that trait in our, our trait um, ontology yet, but we're gonna define it. We're gonna define it in the way that the community can access those trait definitions you know, via the interwebs using URIs. And they're gonna be tied to other existing ontologies to describe anatomy like Uberon and Peto um, for traits. So that's exciting because it means that we basically have this sort of on, um, ontological and semantic framework and linked open data framework that sits at the heart of what Futures is all about. And so just this last month, we were, we were um, able to release our, our um, beta portal where you can actually go and find data about, about body mass and body lengths of all sorts. You can see that the traits that are available are much more than just you know, length or, or mass, um, or at least body length and mass. Um, so there's all kinds of data available here. And you, know, you can filter this um, really easily by life stage and by trait, by taxon. <clears throat> or by project and get a really um, awesome set of data that you can use for your own studies. Um, so check it out. Okay, so I've come to the end of, uh, end of my journey, actually. I have one more thing to talk about <clears throat> very quickly at the end here. And I just wanna say that one of the most gratifying things about the, um, the work um, uh, shown here is that, you know, besides following my, my feet and oftentimes following with my friends and colleagues and making that trail, um, Many others have seen the power of what we now call the extended specimen to fuel new research. And it's really an exciting time to be working on natural history and with natural history collections data. And whether it's genomics or phenomics or whether we're talking about species interactions or, or working with the specimens and, and the, that relate back to the, to the, to the um, environment, our ability to take those, um, bring them out and, and work with them and then look at how that relates to broad scale questions that Dan brilliantly talked about at the beginning of, of, of his introduction is really, really powerful and really, really exciting and, and, um, and gratifying. And um, funnily enough, this slide is actually from a 2014 talk I gave. It was the last slide of a presentation, kind of uh, conceptualizing my view of what the extended specimen network may look like over time. 
And uh, it's fun to put it into a talk, you know, seven years later and realize it's just as relevant, just as interesting, and even more exciting now than it was when I first was thinking about this back in 2014. And with that, I have a huge host of acknowledgments to, to make really quickly here. Um, this journey was one that was taken with lots of people, Paula Zermaglio, Narani Barvi, Brian McLean, John Machorek, Daijan Lee, um, who is an assistant professor of quantitative ecology now at LSU, Maggie Hantak, with, um, whose main interests are in polymorphisms and, polymorphisms and trade um, evolution, and our great futures postdoc, Megan Balk, who's really interested in body size eco, um, eco evo questions. And finally, um, Rafe LaFrance, who is amazingly hard to photograph, who is this incredible informatics developer, has been key for a lot of this work. And with that, I just want to say thank you guys so much for listening. I hope I managed to um, make it through the end without losing my voice or having the microphone give out, but I'm really excited to be taking part in the panel coming up here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Rob. I guess we'll give you the virtual um, uh, applause. So uh, thanks for the great talk. It was, it was fantastic. Um, just a reminder to everybody, um, if, if you have questions for Rob or, or Dan, as we kind of work into the panel discussion, please use the Q&A box and we'll, we'll work through those questions as they, as they come up. Uh, but, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll and if you would, please uh, address them if you would like them to go to Rob or, or Dan specifically, and we'll, uh, we'll address them that way. Um, Rob, there's a couple questions already in the Q&A that I'll start with that are, um, one is, is definitely uh, tied to some of the, your, your research. Um, it, and it's from uh, Holly Shear. Um, how and why do you filter out large animals from your body size study? What is the significance of outliers? So it's a two-part question. Um, so we, we've been really concerned about a, 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 a problem with some of the data that we have um, for, um, uh, from VertNet. And so um, in the vast majority of cases, we don't have a life history stage reported for the records. So we don't know if they're adults or juveniles. Um, and so because of that problem, it's really difficult to sort of um, not be fitting kind of um, uh, onto genetic change of body size. If, if it turns out that there are biases in juveniles and adults across space or, or time, we wanted to kind of uh, uh, try to eliminate, eliminate that problem. And one of the ways we thought about doing this is we know we do have some reports of juvenile versus adults. We can kind of create distributions of the shapes of the juveniles versus the adults and use those distributions to help us make predictions about how to filter those records that don't have those reports of, of juveniles and adults on them. And so there are a bunch of different um, methods that we've used to sort of try to filter records to be um, usable. But one of the really um, interesting things about that is um, the first thing we thought of, well, we're just gonna use, you know, basically the great work that's happened mostly in Michigan, I think on ADW to kind of get the adult body size range. Um, but when we, um, uh, just purely kind of cropped the body mass distributions to the range that are reported in the literature, it does a couple of things. First of all, it, it, it assumes the literature is right, and which it probably isn't. Um, and second of all, it tends to skew your, your distributions to, to look funny when you think about them in a statistical framework. And so we, we've, we've been thinking about this one forever. And what, what I like to really encourage is, you know, as we get better and better at publishing our records about about um, the specimens we have, incorporating like life, life stage and life history information with those records is super valuable for the best use downstream for, for global change studies. Um, I don't know, did that actually answer your question in the right, in the right way? Let's see if Polly will add a comment here, but uh, I, I think that sounds great, uh, Rob. Um, kind of kind of to build off of that, uh, one of the questions from the panel uh, panelists uh, or the, the ECSS committee that I think relates to that question is is that taxonomy on these obviously is an important underpinning of your work uh, and you know making sure that the the labels on the tags are what they are right um, you know, as a mammologist myself I, I you know your your work with Paramecium paniculatus probably one of the most misidentified animals in North America despite the fact that it's probably one of the most abundant mammals in North America. Um, and, and, and there's other things there's, you know, likely that there's more than one species there. How, how do you guys account for that in your, in your trait work uh, when you're really kind of getting down to the nitty gritty of, you know, very subtle differences in mass and measurement data that's taken 
across a broad range of this this particular species? Yeah, great question, Cody. So, so I think like for a long time, in my view, uh, taxonomy was like the third rail of of biodiversity inf informatics. It's so difficult, right? And at the heart of the taxonomy problem is two different two different issues, three different issues. Um, some a little more trivial, some really really complicated. Um, the first issue that I think is 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 less complicated is is basically linking up names around synonymy. You know, currently valid names versus names that are, are not currently valid, they're out of date. And that problem is pretty easily solvable. The second really much less soluble problem is um, tax on concepts. You know, do we have the delimitations right? And as new information is generated that says, you know, this is actually a split or, or we're recombining, you know, basically um, two name units into one uh, via lumping, how can we, you know, basically get that information out fast enough? And so like for, for herbs, like the the split rates are ridiculous. Like I think there, you know, if you look at the flux of concepts in in in, in um, like inurans, it's incredible, right? In like twenty years, I think like fifteen to twenty percent of the names have changed, which is a really huge amount of of change that needs to be linked back to the specimens, right? Because the specimens bear those names, and that's that's um, and those labels need to be updated to reflect the current knowledge. The, the least soluble problem from my perspective is the hardest one of all, and it's one you've mentioned, Cody, and it keeps me up at night. Dan gets kept up at night about, about stuff. I, I have the same things that keep me up at night as Dan does, but I also get kept up at night by misidentifications. And really there, we're just gonna have to rely on the fact that as more of these data get used, we have to go back to the collections. You know, For the, the phenology study, uh, Brian McLean, I hope he's actually here on this, this call, this, um, this um, symposium, you know, and I were at the Smithsonian looking at these specimens and recognizing that some of the work just has to be back in the museums. Brian says here, awesome. Um, so, um, you know, Brian, if you want to jump into the Pima misidentification rate, you're welcome, you're welcome to in, in chat. Um, but I think that the, this is a larger problem. And I think if you talk to anyone across any collection in the museums and Brad and Raphael, I'm thinking about, about um, at the Florida Museum, you know, the, the um, uh, Waltz, you know, co constantly talking about the fact that, you know, 30 to 40% of, of plant specimens might be misidentified. That's a huge problem. And it, it isn't solvable by, by um, you know, doing data sciences. It's solvable by having experts working in, in, in taxonomic disciplines. And I wanted to mention one really important thing about that. While I um, will talk about the importance of biodiversity informatics, biodiversity informatics has no value unless it's tied and couple deeply and strongly the taxon expertise and, and field-based biology and, and sort of people working who know their stuff about the specimens that they're working on and the taxa they're working on. So, um, you know, we need to have a, a healthy ecosystem. And it's not just that they're gonna be data, data users and people who just, you know, blithely use these data. We need to basically remember that you have to have expertise and knowledge and, and uh, value that in this ecosystem we're gonna build that will allow people to do more work with these, these natural history collections data and innovate with them. Looks like Dan has a comment there. Go ahead, Dan. Well, I just wanna build on one, of, on one of Rob's points here because this just sort of puts me on one of my many soapboxes about various things. But this particular, this particular issue about pointing out this, uh, when you mentioned frog taxonomy, for example, and this, and this massive change in, in taxon names, I would just add to that that this is this problem is exponentially worse for for any type of biodiversity data that does not involve Valtrin specimens. So I try to do you know look at these data sets that, that people have collected and invested in terms of long-term biodiversity monitoring over 50 years in places like Australia, where I've done a fair amount of work and looked into some of their long-term data sets. And you could not go back through and and figure out what a lot of these things are. And it's not just a matter of like, oh, we know that the taxonomy changed at this point in time, so we can flip in a new name. It is there are fundamental issues, and you're going to say, well, you know, species distributions have changed. In some cases, there are actually legitimate cryptic taxa that are there. I mean, they may not be truly cryptic, but from the perspective of the knowledge that was there 20 years ago, they truly are. They are cryptic, and so you could say, what what are we looking at, like? You know, some tax are totally unambiguous. There is no question that you know, 50% or more of the species that are named like that are going to be in, a, in those types of databases. We could figure out what they are, but but when you're not vouchering, you are still looking at like what, 15 point percent, 20 percent, 30 percent. In some cases, for some tax, even some vertebrates, uh, at least reptiles and amphibians, would be would be a lot of would be junk data in some of these databases without voucher specimens. So 
I think it's a serious right. issue. And, and you always have the, have the opportunity, at least with the specimens in this sense, to even with these taxonomic uncertainties, you can go back to things and potentially address some of these, at least with a commit with an investment in with in, in resources and allocating resources to the specimens you already have. Hey Dan, I'm gonna I'm gonna double down on that a little a little more. I feel like we're gonna like continue to like amplify this this message a little bit. But one of the reasons why we were so psyched about Futurist um, <clears throat> is that you know the the species level trait databases that have like averages. What happens when names change? I mean, what do you do with the trait data? You can't. I mean, do you split it up in half? Do you like you know take that um, mass range that was between 100 and 150 um, grams and like you know, put 100 to 125 in one part of the split. And so how do you even do that? But if you have the individual measurements, you never have, you know, as long as the identifications are right, which is a huge issue, you can basically parcel out the, 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 the reporting in the right way from the individuals up. And that's one reason why I think working from specimens and from vouchered specimens is, is always the core of, of any kind of biology. Um, so, I mean, not every kind, but yeah, you can remote sense things, but like, vast majorities of our, our knowledge about, about biodiversity and organismal biodiversity comes from vouchers at heart. Uh, great, I, I think moving kind of a related sort of topic um, and, and well, I think I suspect we'll probably come back to this uh, again, is, you know, obviously this, this amount of curation, whether it's curating the, the labels to the current taxonomy, um, or, or uh, uh, you know, making sure the data is as high quality as it can be when it goes into a data aggregator and it gets harvested um, by, by users. You know, there's an incredible amount of work that happens at the curatorial level, at the collection manager level, um, that is definitely academic in nature and pro providing uh, sort of research perspective to those specimens that are being utilized downstream by other users how, how do we you know how do we get better about recognizing that work and and uh you know recognizing uh the curatorial aspect that goes into managing large collections i mean not, not just large any collection of, of of any size that are being utilized by the research community Cody, that's a great question and the 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 short answer is that um, credit models in academia are, are one of the hardest thing, nuts to crack in all of our, our problem spaces. I mean, I, I honestly think that, you know, the, the you know, back um, 75 years ago, somebody decided, you know, we're going to start counting publications. And that's our unit of currency for what we think about when we talk about, you know, academic um, value. And I think in, in 75 years, the world has, has, has radically changed. You know, we don't, we don't just have to count, you know, um, you know how many times a, um, a, a reference in a paper links back to, you know, a, a, the, the, the document. And I'd say like, you know, what we need to build is a better way to, to, to track um, what we do professionally that's broader and more interesting than what we have right now. And so I think, you know, there are a couple of, of, of um, you know, sort of promising signs. I know Dave Shorthouse has developed um, a, a way to kind of track some of these, these by via a tool called Bloodhound um, to track some of these um, um, ways that people, you know, make corrections and then those annotations become publications or the little micro publications, right? And that, that, that can be counted. Um, and it, it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I, we wrote, um, a couple of papers on, on this topic uh, many years ago about kind of micro publications and um, and uh, um, some of the ways that we could be more flexible about about sort of trying to be egalitarian and, and more openly thinking about about capturing more than just your your some worth as a as a person or a researcher via publication trails and I, you know I think the maybe as, as um, academic units reevaluate what they really 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 care about and want to find people who are Basically committed to, to to broader visions than than the next publication, we're, we're going to get there. So, like at the Florida Museum, we're, we're we're actively asking ourselves: Is that the only criterion? What about building a better um, community, building a more diverse and, and inclusive community? How can we do that and make sure that that becomes part of what we credit in terms of our professional success? And I think we just need to have those conversations and recognize how they're how we do that. I also would say that 
museums in particular, as a little less true of departments, I think intimately, I mean, my museum, I think intimately understands that, that there are different pieces of the puzzle we need to solve. And I, I'm not sure it's true to every museum, but I think if museums make the case that they ultimately are one of the most important resources for knowledge of the natural world and, and really are firmly taking their, their place at the table and say, you know, we really have something that is, is, is absolutely invaluable. I think we need to see the message louder and then not be, not be the, the, the tail wagging the dog on credit models. I think there's a lot because like, um, you know, um, Dan mentioned something really important in his, in his opening presentation. And I think I want to mention one thing about that. Um, and the world has effectively entered a period where it's, it's not only we're we losing the biodiversity, but disequilibrium dynamics are, are um, uh, that, is the, that is the present and future. It's a disequilibrium future. What that means is like, when we think about like climate um, distribution, species um, abundance distribution relationships, the data collected today is actually gonna be less valuable than the data collected 100 years ago because we're, we're, we're collecting data about disequilibrium rather than equilibrium that is necessary to understand those relationships. And so our past data will become vastly more important as our future data becomes vastly less about the, the sort of natural systems components and more about the, the Anthropocene. And so uh, just a way of saying like, you know, a, a long story short, better models, um, better social practice. Like we gotta just change, change our social practices today, not tomorrow, not in, the, not, not in five years. Dan? So well, I have a, a follow-up to that, which is, you know, this, this idea, just, you know, the, the point kind of originated with this idea of, you know, in some ways a credit, crediting or credit with respect to curatorial sorts of things and, and what happens at this level. But there's this flip side of this, which is that, which involves what I perceive as a, a, a deep pathology of the way a science is practiced in some ways, which is that we are, I mean, this is not necessarily a, a fault of the field, but we are a field of biodiversity consumer, consumers and that we consume biodiversity data. And in general, when you play in the, in the sort of intellectual sphere of doing the big questions, we're going to do the big thing in species diversity. We're gonna look at speciation rates in a global sense. We're gonna do these big macroevolutionary trait things. We're gonna map out species and do conservation priorities things and get the big papers in PLOS or science or PNAS. There is a there's a disconnect there between the consumerism of the data and the who's paying into that data and how the data is being credited at that level. So in some ways, there's I, you know, I think the field has to wrestle with this fundamental problem of like, you know, flashy results that are taken on the cheap in terms of not being not being not not having this not just recognition, but essentially paying into where this sort of frankly very altruistic component of of this intellectual data is, which is, you know, sort of at the curatorial level and all the things that that entails from the collection to the curation to everything else, it, to the, you know, making the data available to the community. I mean, there are, there are, there are so many problems there with how we deal with this now. And I mean, uh, you know, I think some of we can, there are many ways in which we could potentially without even fundamentally changing the nature of, of, of the way we do science, there's ways in which like at the editorial level, for example, like journals, journals could be upweighting the way they could make it mandatory that 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 people are doing things like feeding back when they into like databases, for example, when they are, you know, generating the types of data from specimens, for example, that you described in your talk, Rob, or other things where where editors are taking into account, is there an original data contribution here, or are they essentially paying back into this community that they're essentially taking data from? Uh, as sort of something that, that becomes an extra bump into whether this thing actually, you know, merits the standard of peer review or publication in a particular journal. I don't know, I think there's a lot of potential, potential solutions here that, that we're not necessarily discussing as a field, but I think we should be. Yeah, so, so Dan, uh, one, one more comment on that thread. You know, when we published this paper on, on Bourbon's role in eLife, we actually cited every single provider um, in the reference and cited. And admittedly, the way to do that now is to cite the DOI, right? You, you know, you get the data, you, and this is now routine practice in my, my lab group. We never publish a paper where we're not citing a DOI back to the data, data that were used in that, in that publication so that basically GBIF can assemble the publication trail so, so that the, public, the publishers get, get citation credit. And I think the thing that's going to have to change is, 
you're right, there's, there's like two sides of this, right? One is like, editors need to say, you need to show that you're a good citizen and not not a data parasite, right? You're, you're gonna be buying into the community um, and working with them to basically make this a better ecosystem. And I have a bunch of slides I didn't talk about that um, lay out my view on this matter, kind of because I, I think a lot about community and communities working together to curate and, and improve data. And until we actually view that as a, as a collective enterprise, it's not about your citation impact, but about doing the work that, that benefits the big question, not, not the big questions, I totally agree, Dan, or the big macro evolutionary questions, but the big thing is, can we collectively work to solve problems that are gonna save us from ourselves, right? And that's so gonna require us- what do, you, what do you think? What do you think the best, what do you think the best way, you know, in your sort of view, what do you think the best way is for that incentivization? I mean, as I see it, there's a big cultural disconnect now between, even if I look across the landscape of people I work with and collaborate with, there's a big disconnect in some ways between the people who are sort of plugged in the museum community who already think like that. And, and a lot of the others, most of the others who, who sort of don't, haven't really assimilated that. So what is the, what is your sort of, you know, if you were thinking about ways which we could break that down and sort of change that, that cultural landscape, which I think is really what has to happen here. I don't know if you, what sort of ideas do you think might be effective at, at doing that? <laughs> yeah, I kind of hope that maybe like, I know that, that NSF has made um, more um, overtures in some respects around around funding or to, to um, facilitate and um, uh, make catalytic like team science approaches. And you know, I think with this new Center for Open Environmental Data and Synthesis, a question will be whether that's you know, sort of activity that will be community coalescent can kind of spread um, social practices more broadly across a community in a way that actually takes root. And I think that the problem is, is that, you know, you, um, the center models have still been very much like, I do a meta-analysis, I publish a paper, and this goes into, it goes into tree or something, right? Um, and we need to stop perpetuating that model and have models where, where we are enabled to do, to do team science. And the results are like this, this group without any names associated with it, but this group produced this, this really neat community model that solves a problem. And I, and I think like, um, you know, other disciplines have been much faster at getting there, but as, as I think a lot of our science becomes a lot more um, geared towards like trying to, to be more ultimately collaborative and inclusive, I think the push is there but honestly, it's carrots and sticks. Like the carrot will have to be the funding, the stick will have to be the journals and the, and the editors kind of pushing against basically bad practices and demanding that, you know, if you don't cite a DOI as a minimum when you publish a data paper, like it's just, that's just not acceptable anymore. You just can't do big, it. Big physics would you know, be an example of a community that to some degree has done this, right? You look at the big astro projects, the, the LHC project, other sorts of things. I'm not saying that there aren't, there aren't problems there, but nonetheless, there is a more collective model that operates in terms of as a community with respect to the data projects. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think this has been like the, the conversation I've had for 25 years now about why we're not physics. And I think in part, it's just because, you know, there's always been place-based sort of individualistic, you know, research programs that are perfectly reasonable and wonderful. I, I wouldn't want to give up on the idea that place-based research and, and, you know, PIs who do have their slice of a, of a puzzle aren't able to do that kind of work. But what I want to see is that, that instead of thinking about it truly as puzzle pieces that are basically scattered across this huge board of, of the globe, we actually are trying to fit the pieces together and make them connect, right? If we can do that, then maybe as those connections start to cohere, people will see that the laterality, this sort of ability to think about inter interdisciplinarity and, and team science is actually going to be a better model and a more rigorous model for them to be able to do the, the kind of science they wanna do. I don't do the science because I expect to get citations. I do it because it's super fun. And it's interesting and awesome. And because I really believe in interdisciplinarity, I want to work with really interesting, broad people who do awesome things. And I mean, ultimately, I would much prefer that awesomeness than anything else. And so if we make it so that awesomeness is the, <laughs> if we make it so that awesomeness is the core of what we, what we are talking about in terms of how people get, people feel valued, I think that could, you know, start a process. So, so not a great, great conversation, but to kind of switch topics here just briefly, because we're, you know, we're alluding a lot to the data, quality of data and the, you know, the work involved behind the scenes. Um, but, you know, as we, as we kind of, and there's been several questions in the Q and A and a couple in the, in the chat that revolved around data and how do we, 
if we're going to the field, um, you know, obviously we're collecting these animals, we're bringing them back into our collections, we're spending a lot of time and effort and making sure that data is as high quality as possible. But the original collection event um, that involves whether it's uh, uh, you know, taking measurements or taking tissues or parasites, whatever it may be, how do we optimize that to make sure that it's uh, as, as useful as possible for users downstream? And I think it kind of gets to the extended specimen concepts that, that you refer to, Rob, and, and Dan, I know you, you mentioned that as well, but how do we make sure our collections are that really live beyond what was thought to be a, just a traditional systematics and taxonomy exercise, but an exercise, a, a, a process that really engages a variety of uh, stakeholders that are beyond the traditional you know, user group of a, of a museum collection. Hey, Dan, do you want to sort of take that one and start? I'll, I'll jump in afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot about this and it, it, I guess it comes down to, I, I don't have a good solution at the, at the sort of museum end of things, but where I think about this is the, is with the promise of essentially, I mean, we look at all these other, these other, these, and actually this gets to something that we were talking about earlier about what, you know, where, uh, where in time a specimen is collected in terms of its value. And I actually think that we, right now we're actually, the specimens we collect now, even in the disequilibrium world, in some ways are more valuable than ever before, because we can, we can think really hard about these, now these long-term uses and, and ways, the types of data that we can collect that weren't possible. And the most important data for me in some ways are what the type of data we're typically not really doing a good job of tracking, which when we think about extended specimen, I think that the word extended, going back to this idea of an extended phenotype, I like thinking about this, this idea of the extended collection situation. So these are all the properties of like the community, the ecology, the habitat, the, uh, the abundance and the, the sort of trapping method and what that tells you in terms of reconstructing something about the population itself, what that community looks like. These are all these extended things that don't even sit cleanly within any typical sort of framework here in terms of data. How do we represent this stuff? How do we get people to record this stuff? Um, you know, some of the stuff, you know, people have done some of this stuff with like looking at, um, there's certain kinds of collection events that that, that work very, very well with this. Like if you go and like fog a tree and a bunch of stuff comes out, well, we dump everything into, you know, a, a single jar of ethanol and we can literally reconstruct the species abundance distribution from that fine. But ma many, many other types of collecting events don't actually fit that sort of clean model there. So how can we actually think about a forward vision of what collecting is that, that lets us maximize the amount of this sort of extended data that, that that we're not going to get any other way for so many of these communities that are going to end up on in a soybean field in the Amazon at some point in the future or whatever, you know, climate's going to change and vegetation community is going to change. Uh, and how can we, how can we actually make that available to the community in terms of some sort of, of, you know, we, we talk about ontologies and standardization conventions and so on, but what, how do we do this for these more complex ecological attributes? I mean, this is reflecting to some degree my bias and personal interest and the types of things I would like to do stuff with, but but I, I feel that that's a, that's a huge, both an opportunity and a challenge, and I don't actually have a great solution, um, but yeah, I think it's out there, and I think it's something we should be thinking about because this is this is sort of our chain. We're going to the field in a lot of cases. We're spending a lot of we're spending resources on this, and this is a huge way of really maximizing long term potential of, of some of these some of these data. Yeah, that's a great great point, Dan. Um, so I, I see from two sides. Like I think on one side, like we're going to generate a ton of a really exciting data from the samples we already have with their limitations about how reporting happened uh, re regarding the, the, the process, the event process that generated that, that, that sample. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you know, after having watched what is possible now with, with CT scanning, really the, the, the amazing um, strides we've made in, in, in um, um, sort of um, using historical samples for genomics, there's a lot of the extended specimen that's going to be developed um, purely from sort of post um, accession, you know, voucher specimen um, work, and that that will be part of that huge network of of data and knowledge and and representations that sit around the, the physical material. And the physical material, to me, is the most important thing, right? It's at the center of all our graphs. Um, but Dan's totally right. Like we need to do a better job of of assembling. Um, the reporting at the inventory level about what happened when we did that inventory. And 
like it, it's fine. Like if your inventory is is purely incidental, awesome. Like that's perfectly reasonable, and you can report you know Darwin Core um, level metadata. But if you're inventorying in a way that requires you to to actually think about taxonomic scope or or a sample method that is you know is reportable, you should be able to report that with as an event report with your that relates to your specimens, that relates to the things that you collected in the field. And so I, I, I've been thinking about this forever. And finally, um, in 2018, we published a, a paper on this thing called the Humble Core, which was supposed to basically allow you to, to, to report um, the, you know, the, the metadata about the inventory process, what happened during an inventory. Um, but a lot of times we really do want to do planetary inventories. We're talking about planetary inventories is a really important piece of this puzzle. Um, and when we wrote that paper, it was basically a concept paper. It had some terms and it had some, you know, like, you know, concepts behind it. But in the last year, the last few months, um, Paula Zermaglia, who was mentioned as um, a collaborator, and I and a bunch of others, John Machorek and, and a bunch of people from across infrastructure. So this is ALA and GBIF and, and Map of Life. I've tried to really think hard about converting that into a usable extension for the Doran Core. So that when you publish your records, if you have the inventory metadata, you can publish it in a way that's simple and clear. And I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, this is going to complicate publishing data. It's not going to be as easy as, as, as mapping fields and hitting the button to get Darwin Core. It's more complicated because our designs are, are nested and replicated in different ways. And it's going to be more of a pain in the butt to actually publish the data. That's OK. We, 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 we walk down the road of learning how to publish the simple stuff. Now we need to walk down the road. I feel like this is all about journeys. My god. Um, we're going to walk down the road to publish the hard stuff. And that's good. We'll get there if we're committed to the cause. Anything to add, Dan? Well, no, I, just gonna, I was just saying in some ways that's, you know, you can imagine some of these, some of these conventions also evolving through time and, and our ability, our ability to use data are, can, that are always going to be contingent on whether we recorded things right to begin with, right? So actually this is just, I guess, some comment for, for folks working in the field is to, I guess my, I would su suggest thinking hard about the way you record things like your, your effort, your sampling, the actual way in which you're doing, you're doing your work in the field in a way that even if we have no way of actually thinking about how that's going to be served to the community now, that doesn't mean that in 10 years we will, we won't. So, you know, I guess that, you know, my view is to just be as thorough as you can about every possible way you can, you can, to the extent that you have the time and resources to do so, quantify the amount of effort you're putting into these sorts of things. And, because that sooner or later we'll find ways of, of maybe making some of this comparable such that it can be used more generally. Yeah, so Dan, I also would just say like, I'm, I've been really fascinated to watch um, some of these thematic collections networks that are focused on, on species, species interactions and how much work we have to do to piece together like the parasite that came from the vertebrate host. And like, we can do it, but the fact that we have to do like, um, this huge amount of work to link the specimen that went to one museum that is the, the host species and then the other museum that has the parasite data and to reconnect those dots at the specimen level. If we did that upfront better, we wouldn't spend thousands. It's like, it's like you, you've tripled the work or, or quintupled the work to do a post hoc than to do it upfront in the field, right? And so if we were able to be a little bit faster about kind of baking those practices into how we operate every day, it would be a lot easier for us to make, make kind of significant progress on like basically specimen level host parasite relationships or any kind of interaction at all, even you know, mutualistic like pollinators. Yeah, great. Well, we're kind of, we're, we're coming to a close here. There's, there's actually, this is I think probably in terms of questions, a great set of questions to end on um, that, are, that are in the Q and A from graduate students that are you know, looking um, at finding ways to leverage collections in the research that are, you know, wanting to know, you know, how do we, how do we get students, high, high school age students, undergraduates, uh, community college students interested in to natural history work? Um, and how do we train that next uh, cohort of scientists that are going to come up and, and really be responsible for addressing some large scale questions that re require a, uh, you know, this sort of the basic underpinnings of organismal biology to, to, to address climate change, urbanization, and you mentioned pandemics. Um, you know, what, what, do we, what do we need to do to, to train that next, next generation? 
Wow, that's like the million dollar question. I, I, it's a, such a hard one. Um, Dan, you want to jump in here? I, I mean, I'm happy to do it, but I, maybe you want to start this one up. I mean, yeah, I would agree. There's there's many, many, many levels to this question, right? I mean, from from reemphasizing the sort of ologies and but this doesn't, this isn't independent. I get, you know, I guess the first thing I'd say is that this isn't independent of the rest of our discussion here, because this, this leads to these ideas about even just training and just doing a better job of training students comprehensively to think about where their data come from and, and what goes into this and, and what goes into the, the data that might be, you know, that they are using to, even if you're working with ge geographic distributional or taxonomic data, there, there is a, there is a, there is a, that there's a cost to that data. It, it comes from something, uh, and so just even instilling like an ethic into that, and whether that where that come, you know, how we how we in some ways, if you're in a museum community like Rob and I are, it's 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 easier to to work with this because we are you know the students who come through our program, you know, they're working with the collections, they're sort of getting exposed to this over and over again. I I, I have I I am I have maybe fewer ideas about necessarily how we how we address that more generally. Um, but it's something we talk about a lot here at, in terms of what, what kind of training we provide to our students, but how, how you address that with, with, with outside of a museum community is, is certainly more difficult. Well said, Dan. I, I, I agree with, you know, the, the main point. And I, I think, you know, the thing that we're going to grapple with in museums in the, in the um, next uh, few decades and probably forever is really a, a huge set of issues around who, um, who's, who's, who, who can be in, in the museum and, and where, our data came, you know, originally came from, and that they're just very difficult issues about, about making sure that we actually live to the creed of being, you know, able to to be, uh, you know, really open and inclusive in in a museum setting. And I'm not saying that museums, I think museums are the most awesome place to work in the whole world. Like I, I'm so um, amazed, literally amazed that I get to work at a museum. It is like it blows my mind every day. Um, but I think there are a lot of people who would feel the same way if given the opportunity to know how to get it in the door and that the, the, that the door existed. And I think that's just gonna take a huge, um, you know, movement away from viewing it as business as usual in 2021 and in the next decade around how we consider reaching out and, and, and pulling people into our worlds and telling them that they're, they belong, that they're a part of a community that can be very supportive and very nurturing to grow people who love natural history. I mean, look how many people use iNaturalist. Look how many. Tell me those people aren't interested in, in, in biodiversity. I mean, there are literally millions of users. How many of them are gonna walk into a museum and be jazzed about all the stuff we have in our drawers if they knew how to do it? If they knew that there was an entrance, if their parents didn't tell them you're never gonna make money in natural history. And if, if, if they were told that there's actually careers and really awesome work that can happen, that they're gonna be data scientists in natural history museums in the next decades. That they're gonna be people who will be able to do tons of really interesting things that are beyond just the science. They're gonna be able to blend outreach and, and education. They're gonna be people working on totally new modalities about how we look at, at, at the natural world and natural history. And getting those people in because they're the innovation drivers, they're the ones who are really critical for the next generation, right? That's the whole point of the symposium is that there's this next generation coming, we're gonna be ready to enable them to be successful in museums. We need to talk about this every day in every meeting about how to make that happen. There's some natural, really natural connections to students there because you know you mentioned iNaturalist. I mean, just sort of re-establishing re this, this valuation, this valuing of, of the basic, doing basic natural history of just going out and documenting what the heck is out there, right? And what things are doing in nature. And I mean, whether it's frankly, even a museum or a naturalist or ending up as like a herp note or whatever, like this, this, this process of getting basic fundamental natural history data and making it available in some form is something that many of us love to do, whether we're in a museum or not. It was inspiring to us as we started our own career. And I'm sure that there's a huge cohort of students out there who may not have been exposed to it, who would totally gravitate to that if they were exposed to that. So, and I think that goes far, that's a far broader sort of way of, you know, getting at this than just museums per se. I think that's a, a, a good closing and, and, uh, and, and, and Rob, thank you for the, the nod towards the you know the innovation aspect uh, of this this entire thematic um, symposium, um, and I, I, I do want to thank Rob and, and Dan for having a really good discussion. Uh, it seems that most of the people were able to stick around to hear hear this, and I and I do want to remind everybody that 
Um, every Friday from now until April 2nd, we'll be doing this with a different set of speakers from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, and uh, we'll be getting into some of the early career folks that will be joining us for the next couple of weeks and then move in to our last keynote with Pam Soltis, one of Rob's colleagues at the University of Florida. So with that, thank you, Rob, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Cody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, guys. This is awesome. Yeah, thank you, Rob. That was great. That was perfect discussion. So uh, we'll, uh, yeah, hopefully you can join us the next couple of weeks. So plan to. All righty. Yep. We'll see you guys. Yep. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Linda, are we all set?